Welcome back to the Axon Bulletin. It's the Tuesday trio returned. Myself and Natasha have made our way back from Madrid. Lawrence, you were holding fort last week where we weren't here. Um, Natasha, I'll come to you first. I know you were over there, like myself, supporting the hoops. How did you you get on? You weren't uh, an in and out shot. You were there for a couple of days, like myself, and you, I think, enjoyed the city um, of Madrid. Yeah, I did. It was a great trip. Great city, isn't it? Um, I mean, what more can you want than a lot of Celtic fans? The sun was shining in November. There was tapas, there was drinks. Um, and if my voice does start going throughout this broadcast, I promise it was absolutely not related to the number of beers we drank in that square on Wednesday afternoon. Um, but no, I hadn't been to Madrid before. Um, but it's definitely secured itself as one of my my favourite cities. I thought it was lovely. Um, the game itself, we can come on to discuss. The, the entry into the ground was an experience. Um, like you, Declan, I've been to... A fair few grounds across Europe, but I think that this one might be the worst in terms of fan experience, getting getting into the ground. Um, JP as well, the SLO, was echoing similar sentiments, but that doesn't take away from what was overall a, a really great trip in a good city. Did you enjoy yeah. yourself, Declan? Yeah, I did. Um, myself and my cousin Gary were in the home end, so we didn't have as high a... Uh, stretch of stairs that you did up there. We didn't need to take our <laughs> shoes off, get in, mm-hmm. even though I think uh, every scenario was heading through my mind as I was getting into the home end, um, <laughs> undercover or what you all might be met with people uh, and getting in white hoops. So I wish I'd just worn my Celtic top. But yeah, much like you, Natasha, I thought it was a great city. A wee bit disappointed with the Bernabeu tour. Um, it was a wee bit of a bucket last moment to actually get to the Santiago Bernabeu. Um, it's one to tick off, but because it's a construction site, I think it's not meant to be finished till 2025. Um, they're, they're battering on with that. It was a wee bit, yeah, it wasn't the best of football tours I've done. I know a lot of people went and did the Atletico tour, mm. but Lawrence, knowing me, I said no, because I was, just was not sitting in me right to go to do the Atletico tour. So um, didn't do that. Don't blame anybody that did, but I was not going to Atletico Madrid's ground to do the tour. But yeah, much like you, Natasha, I thought it was a great city. Really enjoyed it. Plenty uh, Mau was dunk. Lawrence will bring you into the conversation. Are you a, a fan of the Mau? Yeah, not at all, but I'm, I'm with you. I wouldn't have done the Atletico tour either, but I wouldn't have done the Franco team's tour either. I'm not an admirer of either. Uh, Real Valicano for you then, Lawrence? No. Well, we'd need to be Betis because they also based their colours because of that link with, with Celtic. That's where they got the colours from. Uh, mm. the Spanish boys standing at St. Joseph's, wasn't it? Uh, taking the strip back to, to Betis. That's right. yep. Yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, they've got a Celtic link based their, their, their strip on us. So, yeah, that'd be my, my Spanish team if I had Mine is Barcelona, but I wanted to go and see the, the room with the European Cups because I know there's other clubs in European football and world football that talk about being the, the greatest team in the world, but I really wanted to see that room with the 14 European Cups, which I think really says it all um, for anybody that wants to enter into that debate. But Natasha, the, the journey was made, I think, worth it. Um, I think it was about 67 minutes, actually, when it was about 3 or 4 now, and I thought, uh-oh, uh-huh. don't tell me this is going to be a repeat of the new Camp or the, the Parc de Prance. And then we came to life a wee bit. Obviously, Jota scores the absolute screamer. I think the, the, the trip was actually probably worth it just to see you've mm-hmm. celebrated a, a Celtic goal uh, in the Bernabeu. And it lets us just put the line under the Champions League uh, for this next season and save up for next season. I mean, that's it. We've hopefully got, you know, the, the full year to wait now. Um, skipping the qualifiers. <laughs> um, going straight into the group stage. That's what we'd all we like to so. see. <laughs> that's what we'd so. all like to see. Um but yeah, no, it does give us a wee while to wait for, for another Celtic trip, which is a shame. But what, what I want to end on, um, Madrid was one that, you know, similarly to you, I wanted to tick off the bucket list. I wanted to go to the Bernabeu. I wanted to celebrate my team scoring a goal at the Bernabeu and we got to do that and what a goal it was. Um, you know, the game itself, oh, it got off to a very typical Celtic away in Europe start, didn't it? You just simply can't afford to give away two penalties so quickly in the Bernabeu. You're going to get punished enough at a place like that against a team like that without without doing that and you also can't afford to to miss a penalty at that level um we've spoken for the whole campaign about how we need to take our chances and how we're not clinical enough in front of goal and nothing summarizes that more than a missed penalty but we've been over that um again i was pretty encouraged by the way we we played against real madrid you know i like the football that we're playing i see what andrew's trying to do here 
again, you'd much rather watch us like that than sit with 10 men behind the ball and probably get beat anyway. Um, and it's something he said before, he needs the players to buy into the type of football that he wants us to play. If we play a certain way domestically and then we come and face up against, you know, a really good team like Real Madrid and Ange turns around and says, nah, we're not going to play like that anymore. How does he then convince them that that's the right way of playing? That when we need to be at our absolute best, he's saying, no, we're not doing that. Um, so I think it's good that we're, we're sticking to what we're doing regardless of the opposition um, and instilling in the players that if we want results against the top teams, we need to continue to play the same way because that's the way that works. The results weren't quite there this campaign. Um, I was disappointed overall with our, with our points total, but I wasn't particularly disappointed in the way that we played um, I think we'll improve, like Ange says, we can't we can't enter that competition once every five years and expect to make our mark on it. So what our aim needs to be is making sure that we are consistently there. Um, but we need to make sure we're consistently there with the you know core of the squad as well. That principle doesn't apply if you have wholesale changes in the summer. Um, so I think we need to ensure that the core of the squad stays. Of course, there'll be turnover. He's acknowledged that and aim to get back into those group stages and have another go at it. And I look forward to it because not only did we have some great games, but we had some great trips as well. Um, and those are the highlights of a lot of people's year, mine included. So um, here's to more of those. Yeah, here's to more of those, exactly. And we'll probably get back a wee bit on to Celtic in Europe. I want to touch on that that quote that Ange said at the AGM on Saturday. Um, but we've got a lot to cover today. We're, we're going to be talking um, about some current first team players. We're going to bring the World Cup into it a wee bit. Um, because that's affecting some former Celts as well as present Celts. And we also want to talk about Celtic women. But before we get into it all, I want to just give us a wee shout out. It's below the video. So if you haven't already bought tickets to Gracie's in February, the link is below there. And while you're in the chat, please do let us know if you would like any particular ex Celt to join us at Gracie's in February. January's guest has been revealed. We'll see who it is in February. But please do give us some ideas in the chat to let us know. Um, we will be talking about the Motherwell game tomorrow night so obviously two games to go Celtic now seven points top of the league um, because not all teams can get last minute winners in Perth unlike the hoops but here we are and Lawrence I want to first get into the big news I think today Aaron Moy into the Australia squad good on him but Tom Rogic not there yeah but Tom's uh, made some strange decisions you know when leading Celtic he thought he did something lined up didn't really have anything and then the team he chooses for is it at the right level yeah yeah it's, it's kind of a surprise I don't, don't know what was going on with Tom wanting to leave you know, the rumours where he wanted to move closer to home I suppose he's done that well, not much closer yeah I suppose that Birmingham's lovely yeah but how much do I care about Australia squad you know great that money's in it but it was good when he was here but you know am I really that bothered he's missed out no you know, I'm still celebrating which what, what was a fantastic birthday weekend. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was, what a present. You know, 10 years ago, a 2-1 win against Barcelona on a birthday. And then there was another 2-1 win in a day where we weren't playing. But a yeah. birthday of sorts. Yeah. I never I never thought about it that way. I, I was uh, heading into St Mary's just as the full-time whistle went at McDermott Park. And I've not seen as many smiling faces for a, for a long time entering a, 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 a chapel. And he did give it a mention, just very, you know, quietly into his liturgy, but it did prop up. Um, and again, it was good to see board representatives, Michael Nicholson, went up and did a reading at Mass, and it was good to come together to celebrate it. I know it's not been as widely celebrated for the past couple of years because of COVID, but it's been great. Um, a shout out to Brendan Sweeney and everybody from Celtic Graves, um, as well as all those at the Foundation who have made this an annual uh, get together it is important to I think acknowledge your roots and um, certainly something that Celtic State of Mind did last year um, with our fundraising for St Mary's but yes Lord it's your right what a terrific birthday present um, but Natasha I thought I would just give it a shout in terms of Aaron Moy and, and, and Tom yeah. Rogic because it, Rogic affects Celtic financially and that had he been picked for the squad the, the money's divvied up depending on where a player's been for the past two years Celtic would have got 18 months worth of that money had he been selected but it does really seem a, a bizarre one this whole situation since uh, choosing to leave Celtic in May I feel for him I do but he has made some strange decisions um, I fully believe that had he wanted to stay at Celtic there was still a place for him this season 
Um, I think we've seen it in a few games over the course of the season. You look at that midfield and you think, oh, what could Tom Rogic be doing in the middle of that park? Because he, he left on a high, really. You know, arguably a lot of us agree that last season for Tom Rogic was his best season in all of his years at Celtic. You know, I think he was going to continue to build on that or at least stay at the same level and could have been a really influential part of our season this season. Um, nobody could have, you know, envisaged injury to McGregor, but again, that would have given another opportunity for Rogic to have more game time in the middle of that park. And I don't think we really have another player who's playing like Rogic did last season. Arguably, it was going to be Matt O'Reilly. I don't think he's hit those heights that this, yet this season. He's also started playing a little bit deeper because of injury to McGregor. So I think we really have missed out on having Tom Rogic in the squad. But no one has missed out more than Tom Rogic. You know, he's not getting game time down south. And as a result, he's missed out on his probably final shot at making a World Cup. And... You just have to wonder what was going through his mind over the summer when he's he's making some of the decisions he did. Um, but I feel for him. But I'm delighted for Adam Moy, of course. Um, I think it'll be that's great for him. Obviously, great for Celtic financially as well. Um, and yeah, we don't like Lawrence isn't overly fussed about the Australia squad, but there's some strong Scottish connections in there. Obviously, Scotland have not made the World Cup again. But if we're looking for a for a team to support, then I. I think you struggled to see past Australia with our was it three Scottish born um Australian squad players and seven of them playing in the SPFL. So, you know, if we're looking for a for a team to, to support over this World Cup, then why not make it Australia? Yeah, I, I don't think though that Lawrence is definitely <laughs> gonna be supporting a team that includes Cammy Devlin, St. Murn <laughs> players and a former Rangers striker in it. So well, I think Lawrence will probably look out for have you seen that new, new top, the pink and green top? Yeah, it's a belter. Yeah, you know, if they pick Kyogo and Hitati, I'd definitely have bought it. But, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm still buy it, we'll see. Yeah, Hajime Moriashi's Denny Seller at my 70 quid, not picking those two, so... I mean, that's I'm 140 still... just on today's show, he's done Seller out then. Uh, so I'm still... Quid for me. Well, there they go. Could be so, two uh, pennies, the Tasha would have bought it. <laughs> yeah, Argentina might need to get the shout again this year because I'm a big Messi fan and I'd quite like to see them go on to win it but yeah no, Natasha made a good point in there um, and I think that's almost kind of an Ange Postacoglu factor you, you could possibly say about this um, you, you see guys in there like Devlin I think it's Bacchus it's at uh, St Murn is in the squad obviously Cummins was up here um, at Hibs and another team in, in Scotland um, and you see this connection in the Serie squad and I think the SPFL Premiership, just to kind of touch back on you with us, because um, I know Lawrence, Lawrence is not bothered about Jason Cummins and whatnot, but, <laughs> but we'll get the good Celtic stuff very shortly, Lawrence, but in terms of those kind of players that we've mentioned there, I think the SPFL is becoming that kind of stepping stone league for some players and maybe looking at potentially uh, thinking about moving their career or, or moving to European football, that they're seeing what Ange Postacoglu is doing at Celtic and thinking, yeah, this is a good league to come to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you just have to look at the number of Australians, you know, now playing their trade in, in Scotland. And it probably is a good league for them to come to. I mean, we've got no illusions about being one of the top leagues in Europe, unfortunately. But you just have to look at the careers of a lot of players who have come here and then used it to get into the English Premiership. And if that is your ultimate destination, then why not come and try the Scottish League? So it can only be good for the game as well. It can only be good for you know, the competitiveness of the teams that we're playing round about us and improving the standard in general, if we have a bigger market of players to, to you know, pull from. So, you know, I think it's encouraging to see. Um, and we'll, we'll see how they get on at the World Cup. Got a pretty tough group. Um, I think they start off with a, a game against France. So it'll be interesting to see how this SPFL select fare against that. But I, I can't see them qualifying, unfortunately. Yeah, well, we'll see how they get on. I know Aaron Moy's been in the press today talking about coming up against the likes of uh, and Kunu and Chuamendi that plays for uh, Real Madrid and kind of preparing them well for this. Um, Lawrence, we'll, we'll go on to Aaron Moy just in terms of a Celtic perspective, not an Aussie one. Um, but what has been your take on him? Because I've seen him kind of slowly come into the Champions League Celtic team. He's built up his minutes. He's a player that the manager's spoken about being a, you know, someone who he looks at being important towards the second part of this season. How do you kind of overall rate his kind of start to, you could call it the first part of the season, because I think we're kind of divvying this season up in first part, second part after the World Cup. What has been your overall take in Aaron Moy? 
I kind of was guided. Uh, it was in a penalty spot because Sutton was in seeing Kevin down there, and he, he was saying, like, I don't know, what, you know, when he first signed, I don't know why uh, Celtic fans were disappointed. It was a five, six million pound player for free, who's a squad player for us. I think it's probably performed better. You know, he's now a starting player. I wasn't really expecting him to make himself a starting player. Part of that, so it's like Callum's out. But you know, some people say you know he's not that quick. He's definitely got football and brain. You know, some of those through passes are, are just exquisite, aren't they? You know, it's the, it's the killer pass. You can definitely see it. No, he's, for me, he's been a welcome addition to the squad. And knew him as a player. I think uh, Natasha, you tipped him about three or four weeks before he signed. He's a player we might sign, didn't we? Way back in, way back when. But yeah, welcome addition. I, I think he's kind of exceeded my expectations. I just don't know why people were unhappy with him. I know people were saying, you know, against him, it was terrible. He was playing a holding midfielder role. You know, 35 minutes and we didn't have any shots in target. That wasn't Aaron Moy's fault. <laughs> you know, not putting the ball in the net. Uh, you know, he's playing further back then. Yeah, I, I think he's exceeded the expectations since he came in. And, you know, much like all the players that we've signed on under Ange, they're going to get better the longer they're here, but by the time they get their fitness up and get used to the, the style of play. Natasha, what's your take on him? We saw him go toe to toe in the Bernabeu. He's, you know, been getting ninety minutes. I think he played the whole ninety minutes at Tynecastle, and that thrilling four three win. Um, Gary Melrose coming in to say here he thinks that Moy's class. We get Pat coming in to say that he fancies Adam Moy to score against Motherwell. But what's your overall take being on him? And I think there's something important in what Lawrence says is, to me, he was signed as a squad player, and we've maybe had to over rely on him a bit too much in recent weeks due to the injury of Callum McGregor. And I think someone actually described him um, in, in the Bernabeu, like going to a, a, a knife fight with a bit of bread. But I thought I was maybe a bit too harsh on him. Um, but I think he's finding a bit of form. And the more minutes he gets into his legs, I think it's all the better for him. And a World Cup's going to do him the world of good. Yeah, definitely. Listen, he's a player who's played at a pretty high level. He's got experience. He's got quality. And I think what he offered when he came in was something different. I don't think there was a player when he came in, like him in our squad. And I think he offers that, you know, difference. I think what he gives you compared to perhaps some of the, the players, maybe like Hitati and O'Reilly, is he's got this range of pass that I don't think anyone else offered that's just so pinpoint um, that it offers us something totally different in terms of the way we play. He's perhaps not as intricate and quick a footballer as Hitati is or an O'Reilly is. You know, he's not got the sort of tricks that Jota does, but what he does have is that pass that is very, very rarely wrong. And it doesn't matter if we're playing, you know, against Motherwell away tomorrow night or playing in the Bernabeu. He plays his game and his passing is very rarely off. And I think that's really important for for us in terms of giving us something different and in terms of retaining possession, which is obviously key to our game. So for me, Moy's been an absolutely outstanding signing. Like we said before, nobody could have envisaged what happened to Callum McGregor, but it's just as well we have Moy. Um, we have seen some good rotation across the middle of the pitch, but Moy's been a pretty consistent, you know, player like we've touched on. He's getting more and more ninety minutes. He's getting more game time under his belt, and every time I see him, I think he seems to be getting better and more comfortable in that role. I think you're probably right. I think I don't think we signed him as a starter in every game. Um, I think he's the sort of player that we would have ideally liked to bring on later into the second half when we're seeing out a game when the opposition are tired, when he gets a lot more time on the ball, which I think is really suits him. Um, and we've maybe had to play him slightly more than that. Um, and he's been fine, though. He's handled it. He's handled it very well. I think when Callum McGregor comes back in, um, we'll see a bit of a, a reshuffle again. Hopefully McGregor's back just after the, the World Cup, which is what Andrew's alluded to before. Um, and I think once that happens, then Moy might be the one who, who drops to the bench more often. Um, O'Reilly starts playing a bit more in his natural position rather than deeper um, but for me so far Moy's been been great and look forward to seeing him at the World Cup Yeah, there's, there's mixed comments um, coming in here, people saying that you know, Moy in a, a free transfer was a no-brainer, I've got Mark here to say that great experience to have in a team who's tidy and has role and then I've got the other end of that, Brown Warrior coming in to say he's like towing a caravan and I've got Strange Love the Doctor saying Moy moves like a tank and passes like a sniper, but he believes he's a top pro. Um, don't know what's going outside with the old cops, but we'll bat it on here. Um, Lawrence, in terms of Aaron Moy, probably feeds into the kind of chat around Oliver Abelgard and Sietak Sabanovic. 
I don't think any of these three players were probably brought in to make too too much of an impact in the first part of the season. Do you think that'd be fair to say? Yeah, I think so. You know, Andrew knows the physical demands that his system places in players. He knows, you know, Abelgard Moy, but definitely, you know, behind in terms of fitness, probably Saeed as well. But yeah, I think Moy's been the most successful that closely followed by Saeed. But Abelgard, is he going to get a chance? Because O'Reilly's doing really well filling in as the deep line playmaker. We should stop calling defensive midfielder, I think. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, you would expect him maybe to see a bit more of Abelgard, but, you know, it, it shows good planning behind, you know, if these players are bought in for the second half to kick on. You know, it's November, we're only seven points ahead. So, you know, we just need to kind of maintain that uh, for the second half of the season. But it, it's looking good. Yeah. Uh, if they've, if they've been brought in for the second half, it's good squad management beyond. You know, he knows they'll be up, up to speed to be able to kick on and push us on in the second half. Yeah, this is an interesting one from, from Kevin Graham here, Natasha, just to kind of put this over to you. He's asking, do you think that Moy, he could Adam Moy only be here for a year? Do you think there's potential in that Andy Postacoglu has reached out and been a kind of stopgap player to give him that chance to possibly get into Australia's World Cup squad? Or, or at 32, do you see him, you know, hanging about for maybe two or three years at Celtic? I think it's probably a pretty good place for him to finish his career. Um, I don't imagine that he would have, you know, too much of a move after this one unless it was perhaps somewhere back towards Australia, Saudi, or, you know, a bit of a, a paycheck, somewhere like that. But on the other hand, maybe this is where he wants to finish his career. Remembering his family are from Glasgow, um, maybe it was a perfect fit in terms of finishing his career here and having somewhere that helps him get game time and back into that, make sure he got that World Cup squad. Um, so part of me thinks, you know, there is a real possibility that this is it for him. Um, World Cup squad ticked off, another season here, and then that would be, you know, sort of end of his career and settle in Scotland with his family. Um, who knows what his plans are, but that is, for me, a real possibility. So there is a chance that we could have him for, for longer if we wanted to. I think... You know, people would say he's going to get slower if we, you know, keep him for another year at 32. But, you know, we've not got him for his pace, let's be honest. You know, he's not here because he's he's quick. I don't really see him dropping too much in terms of what he can offer over the next year or so. So I would probably like to, to keep him for that other year if that's what he wants to do. Yeah, I'd be quite happy. As I say, you know, signing him in that free contract, you've already mentioned Natasha, his family from Glasgow and whatnot. Um, so... Yeah, it's it's an interesting one. Whether it is a stopgap for him, I don't know. Um, he's already did, you know, going overseas to to China. He's had that experience, played a little football over there, um, due to COVID and whatnot. So, you know, and getting to play at Champions League level, I think, you know, every footballer's kind of ambition to do so. And he's came up against some real quality talent and that, none other than probably Luka Modric. So, yeah, it's an interesting one to keep your eye on. But Lawrence, you've mentioned. Ted Haksabanovic, he's one that I'm really, really excited about. You know, two goals at the weekend. I think it was good for him to get off the mark for Celtic. I'd expect him to start tomorrow night. That's obviously our, our tagline down there. What changes will Ange make? He's a player I expect to stay in the team. Um, but he's one I'm really, really excited about going forward because I think we've got ourselves a real top player in, Sead. Yeah, it looks like you get getting better week and week. Uh, great addition to the squad. What, again, another crack and find the Tosh in the scouting squad. No, what was it, 1.7 or something? So not a lot of money for a player yeah. in his quality. Five year deal too. Five year deal. Oh. So is it the four year with the option? Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah probably. But yeah, it, 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 it looks to add real quality. He's got an eye for goal. He can beat a man. He can play across the front three wheels so it's Angie's system. But I suppose that's what Angie's done since he's in. He sends players that fit his system. Yeah. Probably more surprised that we work well on it then. He's a player that I, I really like his versatility because we've obviously seen him drop into midfield. You, you speak, Lawrence, about him working well in the system. He does that perfectly well um, when you need him. And as I say, I think he's one that you know excites me and I think second part of the season is going to be a real key player. But Natasha, looking forward to tomorrow night against Motherwell. You know, rotation's been something that the manager has used. I think even again on Saturday... You could sense a wee bit of nervousness within Celtic Park when, when Dundee United get that equaliser. For me, it was always coming, but it's also became like muscle memory for this team that if a, a team bounces back, they just go and do their thing. 
and it's incredible that we can do that. Um, but you know, I don't think Ange Postecoglou is going to shift a toll in squad rotation. I think you're going to see another rotated squad a team on on Wednesday night. Yeah, I think so too. Um, he definitely keeps us on his toes, doesn't he? You know, that was what seven changes um, against Dundee United. You know, that's significant. But like you, you know, I still had that strong belief that even when they equalised, we could push on and get the win. And I think that stemmed from what happened um, away in Perth. And something, you know, Giacomacca said as well, you know, when they got that later equaliser right from the kickoff, the players on the pitch knew that they could do it and that their only objective was getting the ball in the back of the net again. And they did it. So, you know, that gives them then great belief for the next time they find themselves in that position. And we did again against Dundee United, finding ourselves in the position of a late equaliser. But that belief they'll have taken from the St Johnston game of knowing that they can go on and, and, and get the winner really served them well. And that transferred into the stands, I think, as well, because there was no sort of defeatist attitude around me. I think the people in my section fully believed that we were going to push on and get that late winner. And we did not just once, but twice. And, you know, that belief is so important. And, you know, like I said, it's not luck. It's this mentality that he's instilled from the minute he came into the club. And these are the sorts of results that you're going to look back on at the end of the season as pivotal, especially this weekend, especially what happened across the city. It was vitally important that, you know, we didn't concede that late equaliser and that be it, that they push on. And even though, what, there was three minutes left, plenty of time to get the ball in the back of the net again. Um, would I like not to have to rely on that? Absolutely. It's not good for the heart rate. But it's good to know that we have that belief and capability of doing so. But in saying that, you know, let's get it wrapped up a little bit earlier tomorrow night against Motherwell. Um, in terms of the squad, like you say, it's hard to predict what Ange is going to do in terms of changes, isn't it? But I do expect, again, to see wholesale rotation. Um, we'll see what he does. I think for me, one of the, the big debates is going to be Kyogo or Giacomacchus. Um, I think Giacomacchus is going to be disappointed with his weekend um, against Dundee United. I, not that he did anything particularly wrong, but you know, as a striker in a usually one striker system, you absolutely have to take your chances when you're the one that gets the nod to start. And you have to make sure that you're the one that's undroppable because you're the one scoring the goals. And when you get the nod to start and you don't score, and then you know Kyogo does come on and does score you put yourself in a difficult position and I think you could see his frustration when he came off. Um, mm. I don't know if anyone watched him. He wasn't happy. Um, you know, he was hitting the chair next to him. He was kicking the water bottles. And, you know, I don't think that's any you know disrespect towards the club or coming off or anything like that. I think that was frustration at himself because he hadn't taken his chance when he got it. Um, and you've got to do that here. And I think, I think Kyogo is maybe going to likely see the nod tomorrow night, but again with Jack and Marcus perhaps coming off the bench later on, but it's, it's hard to predict with Andrew, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's difficult to predict, and you know, there's a good point coming in here for Brown Warrior saying, you know, when Jack and Marcus genuinely does start, he does tend to score, but you know, Saturday wasn't one of those occasions, and as you say, Natasha, you could see his frustration when he came off, because he's got a great uh, record of starting games for Celtic yeah. this season, and scoring, not to be in Saturday, Kyogre gets on, he's a lauded hero, you know, he gets that header, yeah. um, it's a great piece of work actually, you know, O'Reilly's corner in the, the flick on from the bricky um right on to Kyogo who sticks the ball in the back of the net to send us all absolutely mental. Um and Lawrence, you know my, my dad always says to me it takes 30 seconds to put the ball in the back of the net. It, it, it really was that and Saturday we did it twice um which was a real thrilling into the game. But you know kind of to add back into the mix to me always coming back off a Champions League game it is difficult for, for any team, whether that's in Scotland, whether it's in Germany um, France or wherever else and we've came back after the Champions League this season and I think by the St Mun game I think we've won every game so if we take that one out of the equation which we've, we've covered plenty of times about you know maybe Ange thinking that the squad was ready to rotate too early than it actually was we've been pretty solid in, in that respect and when you come back after the World Cup you don't have that issue again Champions League against one of a, you know, a, a top team back into the league but in terms of the rotation he ain't for shifting in this, he's going to rotate tomorrow night, isn't he? Yeah, listen, I, I'd expect so. I mean, the only re rotation that's worrying me is the, the VAR steward rotation. <laughs> you know, it's kind of, what was that all about at the weekend? You know, I mean, did Bernabe have eyes in the back of his head? I uh, remember Willie Collum done that for a, a dubious decision. I think he's the ref. <laughs> Against Motherwell as well. Uh, but, 
yeah, just absolutely ridiculous decision. And it's good the managers spoke out about it, you know, so strong and saying, look, all the time it's not a penalty, it's, you know, hearts away. Uh, you know, I'm just wondering what the board's going to do about it now, because the rest can't say it's uh, obviously heat at the moment, weren't too sure. You know, they're reviewing these decisions, taking their time about it, obviously slowing down our game by doing so, because three minutes to, to make the decision. You know, as he make it, you know, as his arm there is part of his natural body movement. Well, still I've seen there's two Dundee United players try to hit the ball and their arms are up there. One of them are almost in an identical position. You kind of go, well, that's maybe where your arms end up with, end up when you're trying to hit the ball. And it beg his belief to get a yellow card to say it was deliberate. You know, it's just but yeah, again, you know, the, the team's overcome it. But how many decisions like this yeah, will be made? You know, I know uh, Michael Nicholson had said, you know, they are speaking to SFA about getting the best quality of refs. And for me, I don't think it's down to quality. You know, I, I think it's the other option. Uh, it, it's just really strange decisions. It, it was strange decisions. And it was interesting. I always kind of try and tune in here or read what Dermot Gallagher says in Sky Sports <laughs> on a Monday. And he actually agreed with a decision of David Dickinson at the weekend, which, which to me is, you know, but we're getting to a point now where basically Dermot Gallagher is saying it in the Premier League anyway. Anytime the ball hits a player's hand, it's going to be a penalty. But, Lord, as you rightly point out, if you go back to Tynecastle a couple of weeks ago, the ball hits the player's hand. It doesn't even get looked at. And we're now in a situation whenever the referee is called to look at the video analysis, he's going to point to the spot. But, Natasha, you know, there's something that Lawrence says, and I know a couple of people picked this up on, on Twitter and whatnot, around the kind of zap and the fear that it's, you know, taking around the game. You've got players standing about, which is fans that are at the game. You don't want to be sitting there. You know, it might be good if you need to go to the lure, grab a pie or whatever. Make sure you wash your hands if you're going to do that. But you're not wanting that, those big pauses in the game. I think that's what Ange Postacoglu is on at. You know, if it's going to be a penalty, he would rather it's just made instantly rather than this whole fear and waiting about and then actually going over, having a check, doing his thing, doing his wee screen, then pointing to the spot. I think you'd just rather that that decision's made in 30 seconds because footballers don't want to be hanging about for refereeing no. decisions. No, it's, it's awful. I absolutely hate it. Um, I mean, all of the evidence pointed towards the fact that it was not going to be a positive you know, influence on the game. Um, the fans in England don't like it. You know, There was no reason why the fans in Scotland were going to. And it's been terrible. The way it's been implemented is terrible. The length of time it's taken is terrible. You know, there was guys around me when Kyogo put the ball in the net, you know, go 3-2 up, who were saying, can we celebrate? Is there any checks? It's, you just don't want that. You, you've you just scored, you know, what turn, it's going to turn out to be, like, you know, a last-minute winner. And guys are questioning whether they've got to celebrate because they're worried about a VAR check. I mean, that is just killing football for me that is not what it's about that is not you know what the fan experience should be and it's just so frustrating that it's come to that I don't even think you know it's it's benefiting us in any way I don't think it's taking the subjectivity out of the decisions I think you know like we are doing here we're still looking at a decision that was made and debating it look at the Tony Watt one that was made by VR then it was overturned so you know it's not even helping in the fact that it's not actually taking away any controversy out of the decisions that are being made so for me it's been a bit of a disaster I think a lot of it is down to to the way it's being implemented you know it just it needs to improve it does if it's going to be viable and if it's going to you know not be this saga every single time it drastically needs to improve but I think you know I don't know if it's VER's fault you know when it comes to the handball one as you said Dermot Gallagher thinks it was a penalty as well you'll have to look at the Barcelona game the same night yeah. almost exactly the same incident where the defender's back was turned as the ball hits the back of his arm which was raised as he was jumping that was awarded as a penalty so if the rule is that's a penalty I suppose that's not particularly VAR's fault and it's more to do with with the ruling but if you know you look at the sort of ruling specifically you know it's about making your body bigger in a way that's not justified by the movement and like Lauren's touched on, I think the way his arm was, was justified by the movement of jumping to head the ball. The Dundee United player was doing exactly the same thing. Suggests that that's the movement you make. Um, so I think that one is more of an issue with the ruling that we have in terms of handball, which I just don't think anyone understands anymore. But 
for me, the whole introduction of, of VER has been a bit of a disaster for fan experience, to be honest. Yeah, you even you might up, like rugby do, might the refs up in the back. Can you imagine? Up. Like, so it's well, been Lawrence, years and why they make the decision. I think, you know, in terms of the officials in Scotland, I think they're incompetent. I don't think that they're trained properly. I don't think the decisions are, are right, that there's no real um, explanation as to why decisions are made. You know, that, that links to what you're saying about being mic'd up. But, but standing on Wednesday night in the Santiago Bernabeu in the Champions League, I couldn't for the life of me say why the referee had awarded a penalty for the second team. And I would really like to know what went through the, the, the ref's mind at that point in time, because to me it's cool. soft. They're going to the incompetence in Scotland. They've got to pass the test. You know, they've got to, they've got to pass the test in the rules. These guys know the rules. You know, it's a question of the are they implementing them fairly? You know, the pen away at hearts. It didn't even go to a far review. It's subjective. It should go to a far review. Absolutely. You know, there was a, an instant Tony Ralston claim for a penalty in the first half. He didn't see if the boy clicks Ralston first or he gets the ball first and then goes out, you know, for a comment Celtic. No VAR review. You're going so the guy's competence, I think, has been tested. You know, they've got referee status, so they know the rules, they know they pass tests. It comes there when they're implementing it in a game decision. And particularly for me, only uh, Celtic games, although we have seen some strange, like there was a, a pulling incident in a box, a, a player pulling a, a forward over it on Sunday that didn't go quite hard either. But, you know, it's the implementation of the rules and, and why they're choosing to implement them and not implement them. And I think making them up and making them explain their decisions, you know, not just a, a match report to the SFA a day or two later, but actually saying, like, you know, after the game, look, how are you look at this? This is the decision you made. What was going through your mind? You know, I think fans deserve to know. You know, apart from the life blood of the game, you know, Scotland relies on ticket re revenue more than any other country. Surely, you know, your paying customers would kind of de deserve to know this. You know, why is it a secret? Too many secret societies in, in Scotland, I think, and hopefully they're not having a, an effect in these decisions. Yeah, I think that's a fair point in transparency. You know, I think that's a really good point. And, you know, Natasha, like, like myself, you were at the game in la last week, I, I just didn't get it, but the second decision, I thought the, the first one, um, I see it back on the TV, it, it looked like a penalty to me from when I was sitting in the Bernabeu, but the second one, and again, that's even at a level of football where there really shouldn't be, you know, subjective decisions being made. And again, that probably feeds into the referee's circumstances and being, you know, at the Bernabeu with all the home fans and blah blah blah. But shouldn't be the case, you know. The rules are the rules, and that's how they they should be judged. But we'll we'll draw the line under VAR there because I don't think we want to bang on about it. Don't want to show. That's it. Yep. Um, and we'll see. Hopefully, we're not talking about it after. Tomorrow night, um, of course, we waited Motherwell the last time. It was a thumping 4 0 win. I think Motherwell will have the worst home record in the league. We've got the best away record in the league. What could go wrong? Um, tomorrow night, Natasha, Carol Starfield, where, where do you see the minutes are going to come for the big man? Because obviously, brewing into the, the, the game in the Bernabeu, um, not the easiest of games, I think, for any professional to be thrown into. Uh, Gets minutes under his belt, important for him. I think this this break is going to be really important for Carol Starfield in terms of missing out in the pre season because of the injury he picked up of Sweden. Never played a lot of football. I would expect him when he's over um, and I still get to get minutes. I don't think the USA team's out yet. So Cameron Cartervick is likely to be in that. So you'd imagine that, that Starfield's going to get minutes um, in Sydney. And then I think we've got that one friendly organised against Reigns. There might be another one. But would you expect to, to see a lot more of Carl Starfield as we go into this kind of winter break or whatever you want to call it? Yeah, I think so. I don't expect to see him featuring tomorrow night. Um, I think we saw him at the Bernabeu because we had to. Um, obviously, Carter Vickers didn't travel. But I don't think we need to, to bring him back and, and risk him for, for tomorrow night. Um, not when we've got Carter Vickers and Jens available. I think it just creates a bit of consistency if you keep the two of them in, in the middle as your centre half. So obviously we've been chopping and changing our full backs a fair amount. I think we're probably going to see it, see that again in terms of rotation. So I think on that basis it's then important to keep your, your centre backs as they are, especially when there's no need to change it. But yeah, I think you're right. I think when we expect to see Starfield getting more game time as, as in Australia, um, at the camp I think it's in Portugal where we're going to play Rennes. Um, yeah. So I think 
I think that's probably the perfect time to get him a sort of mini preseason, if you like, get him back to full fitness, get him some game time again, and then have him as a really good option when we come back from the, the World Cup break. And then that's where the headache comes in. Because, um, you know, Carter, Rickers and Jens have been doing relatively well. Starfelt was doing well before his injury. He's also, you know, I think a, a good player who fits, fits Angie's system really well. So that's when that's when the headache starts. Because I think with your centre-halves, that's where consistency is really key. And we would obviously do a lot of squad rotation and a lot of chopping and changing um, in other areas of the pitch. But I think your goalkeeper and your centre-halves are positions that you really want to keep consistent. So, you know, that doesn't bode well for one of the three, you know, Center half. So I think Carter Vickers keeps his place regardless. And I think it's Jens and Starfelt who, after the World Cup break, will be battling out a bit for, for the the second centre half position. I expect Carter Vickers to be away with America, like you say. So over these games in, in America and the games um in Portugal against Rennes, we're obviously likely to see a lot of Jens, a lot of Starfelt, and I think that's going to be really important for both of them and security and who is going to be partnering Carter Vickers going forward in the league. Yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting. Um, I'm a big fan of Carl Starfield. It was really, really important yeah. to Celtic last season. Um, it was a real shame for him that he only got to feature in, in one Champions League game uh, properly in a way. Uh, he started that derby game before against Rangers and came off and that led to Moritz Schentz getting the, the nod. I think he'd have likely started against uh, Real Madrid after that. But it's been a real shame for him. But you would, probably would expect him as you see, Natasha to be battling out with Moritz Shanks um, in, in there um, at centre half, but it's one to keep her eye on. Um, Lawrence, do you think the big man will get any game time over the next two games, Carl Starfield? Uh, no, I, I think it's probably going to be Angie's home coming to Australia, which I believe pays fairly handsomely for us as a team. It pays uh, enough that you can probably sack managers with the money that you get out of it. Yeah, and you know, I was looking at some of the Preparations over there, some of the graffiti on the wall over there, you know, Big Ange with the, the trophy. Uh, Melbourne's kind of looking pretty good, you know. So, yeah, I'd expect to, to see him get game time there. Ange's obviously lined up another centre half. So, I like to think we're going to keep the ends, but I think five centre halves is probably too many. So, I wonder what, what moves are afoot there. Is it, you know, if we keep, I can't say he's wanting to sell Cameron Carter Vickers or Starfield, I'd like to think the ends was staying. Does that leave Stephen Welsh as the, the odd man out of the five? Should we sign the, the Japanese centre half? You know, Starfield and Cameron Carter Vickers to cover a right centre back. The Ensign, a new new boy to cover left centre back. There's been plenty of interest in Welsh, and I don't think he's getting enough game time. I think he could be a good player for us, but I don't think he's getting enough game time to develop. Said at the beginning of the season, get someone experienced in, and, you know, put him in and loan for a season. So uh, I'll be interested to see what, exactly what the, the manager's plans are. Yeah, you did mention that, and obviously, as you touched on it, we've been linked by uh, Yuki Kobayashi um, as a possible r- recruit in. Um, and, you know, Lawrence, you know, I- I- as you said there, you think he could be a good Celtic player about that bit of game time, but we're possibly seeing that just now with, with Michael Johnson um, out-, out in Portugal. His team's doing fairly well. He's got a cracking goal, I think it was last weekend. It'll be interesting to see what the future plans are for him. I'm um, also reading today, just while we're in Celtic loan boys, it looks as if Utrecht want to permanently sign Vasilis Barkas, but he is attracting interest from elsewhere. So that that's quite positive news in terms of Celtic hoping to maybe re- recruit back a bit of the the, the money that we shelled out for him. Was Utrecht not uh, complaining about the, the wages and the transfer fee though? They love to sign him a bit expensive. But listen, right. I'm not yeah. the match performance from him, so. I think when we put him out on the floor to get any money back from him, everyone would have been happy. So I don't think Celtic will be too hard to deal with. You know, it takes away your liability of we have three years left, or, or two plus an option of one uh, on his contract probably. Yeah, so it takes that away, brings some money in to strengthen the squad. You know, tossing the boys in the scouting department seem to be on anything gems all the time, so I'm sure they can use it wisely. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um don't worry, I've not had a power cut. It's just became a bit dark outside and to get to the, the, the lights, which might be a wee bit, but I'll try and sort that out in a wee uh, second. Um, but the lucky, you know, it's expensive these days, so you need to watch. Um, you might need to dig out the candles for Christmas time. But th- there's plenty um, in terms of that. Natasha, I know you wanted to, to just chat a wee bit about 
Celtic women, so we'll, we'll switch over to you for, for that wee update. Yeah, so you might have seen on our social media feeds this morning that Axom um, have announced that we're becoming a patron of the Celtic women's team, um, which is great news as we look to help support the growth and development of, of women's football in Scotland. We all know we can see women's football is significantly behind men's football in its infancy and it, it needs support to grow. Um, you know, just to sort of put that into a bit of perspective for people who didn't know, you know, women's football was banned in Scotland in the 1920s and those restrictions and bans remained in place right up until the 1970s when the Scottish Women's Football Association was founded. So it's easy to understand why women's football is so far behind the men's game. You know, we're talking about the 1970s. That is not too, you know, distant history. Um, so of course it's not developed in the way that the men's game has. But if we continue to support it, if we continue to put more money into it, the better quality that we'll see on the pitch and the more that the game will improve. So by becoming a patron, we're helping with that um, process. And the product really is improving all the time. I'd encourage anyone to go along and actually watch the girls play um, because any preconceived ideas you might have about the standard of the women's game in Scotland, you might be pleasantly surprised because it really is improving all the time in terms of how Celtic are doing, um, in terms of the Scottish League. We've got three full-time professional teams, Celtic, Rangers, Glasgow City. Um, and there is a gulf between the three of them and the other teams who are slowly starting to catch up. Um, Hibs and Hearts are now, you know, under the, the umbrella of the, the men's teams and they're getting, you know, some, some of their footballers are now turning professional. So it is getting there. Um, in terms of the league table and the title, um, because there is such a gulf between the top three and the rest of the teams, the really key games are the games against each other. Um, the first time that any of the top three faced up against each other was a couple of weeks ago um, when Celtic played Glasgow City um, away from home. Unfortunately, suffered a really narrow 2-1 defeat. We lost a really late goal against the run of play as we were pushing for that, that winner. So we are now sitting three points behind the top two. Um, but they do play each other next weekend, so that'll be interesting to see how that goes. There's no game this weekend, but the next fixture will be at home, um, which is the Excelsior Stadium in Airdrie, um, and that's on the 20th of November. Of course, the men's team won't be playing here that weekend. Um, they'll be playing over in Sydney, so it's a good opportunity if you want to, to get some live Celtic football to go along and and support the girls at the Excelsior Stadium and see how it is for yourself. Yeah, that opportunity is there. I know that's something that the clubs try to promote alongside the the, the B team um, season ticket sales for both the B team uh, and the women's team. I don't think are are what they'd hoped for, um, and I think they're, they're trying to look at that and and possibly try to move the games. You know, looking forward to the future a bit closer to Celtic Park uh, and whatnot because it's it's not the most accessible thing. Or trying to improve. Um, the accessibility, but yes, Axom has became patrons. Celtic women's team, and um, the, the details are out there on Twitter if you do want to, to do that. But Lawrence have had a great start of the season. I know they're out the cup, which obviously they won last year. But you know, f I think during the summer months, I was probably, I know you expressed a wee bit of concern, Natasha, about outgoings from the club. But you know, Fran Alonso once again, you know, he seems to have settled down the side, and they're, they're, they're really going from strength to strength still. Yeah, yeah. yeah um Lawrence has watched, you know, plenty of the, the games as well. Um, and yes, there were significant outgoings. You know, you lose your play of the year, you lose your top goal scorer, um, you know, things like that. But the incomings are good. You know, players like Ashworth Clifford, Gallagher have come in and made a, a real impact. How have you found it this season, Lawrence? I think Jacinta's uh, definitely finding her feet this season, isn't she? Even if she gets... Yeah. Sent off for telling the ref to get out of the way, stop blocking the pass. You know, just ridiculous decision. But should we be surprised? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think, think you know it's great to watch. There was some turnover. You know, Chloe Warrington left the beginning of the season as well. She'd been there all, you know, all through the years, hadn't she? Uh, bit surprised to see her go. But you know, I, mean, I think women's football in Scotland, uh, you know, it, it's got a long history. You kind of rather than ladies played through the twenties and thirties. You know, a, a Kelly that was there. Uh, managing that, Siri Smith was a superstar. I don't know if that's Kelly's anything to do with the Celtic, right up to Scotland's own Maradona. Uh, I know Natasha knows Rose Riley. The Celtic tried to sign at one point, 
until they, they didn't realise she was a girl. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, the would have yeah, probably get in trouble for that if he had put a contract in front of you. But no, yeah, this season's been great. Hopefully they, they can bring the league home. Yeah, that would be that would be a real, um, you know, a real forward step I think for the Celtic women's team because it, of, of course at Celtic at this point in time, you know, the priority lately still within the club is the men's first team, but as well as that, you need to grow and develop, you know, the, the brand of Celtic and the brand of women's football. It's not just, you know, in Scottish football we're trying to do that. It's happening across uh, Europe. It's happening across the world. You know, with the numbers that are tuning into the European Championships and World Cups. And Natasha, did you do the the Bernabeu tour last week? I didn't know. No, I saw enough of that. They've got kind of all the different teams that they've got up there. It's quite incredible, you know, trophies for basketball and and everything else. And, you know, it's all about kind of moving into this kind of new age of, you know, a football club having so many different parts to it um, that all make it one. And certainly this is growing arms and legs and and being a a key part of of Celtic at this point in time is something that fans are um, taking an interest in. So, yeah, long may that. Continue. Um, we should just, be reflecting. You know, it was a Celtic football and athletic company for long enough. You know, when they built the stadium, they put in the cycling track. You know, it was some say it was a tax efficient way of, of having a stadium at the time. But you know, it, it, it was always kind of more than just the first team. You know, when it was originally set up. And listen, what's wrong with change? You know, I know we covered quite a few of the games live during the COVID season and. You know, they were great games to watch. I remember the last one, uh, one against Rangers. Cracking, wasn't it? You know, there was a chance they could have won the league there, you know. If it, I think it was three or four games out, we're still going for it. So, yeah, it's... I don't see why anyone would want to kind of deny anyone, you know, playing for Celtic. You know, that, that's these girls' opportunities or ladies' opportunities, you know. And it, it, it'd just be bizarre for me for, for someone to put it down and go, oh, Celtic shouldn't be doing that. You're like, well, why not, you know? Club open it all. You know, what we're saying, we're, we're saying no evidence, but ball with kind of, it's not really open it all then, is it? So, yeah, hopefully it progresses. And, you know, we got a decimal pitch with the idea that it could get more games at Celtic Park. The park could recover. When are we going to see the ladies' team actually, you know, playing at Celtic Park? And, I, I, you know, I'm old enough to remember the, the reserves played at Barryfield. If there was a big crowd, they would just change it to Celtic Park. That was pre decimal pitch. You know, when you had to run up from Barrowfield to Celtic Park to make the kick off. So I don't see why you can put a ladies team on at Celtic Park more often. I know there's there was also plans to build a couple of stands at Barrowfield as well, wasn't there? Yeah, know. that's the one I was going to mention there, yeah. Uh, you know, but we spent the money in a diesel pitch. Surely, you know, we, we should be here, wasn't it? Yeah, it's an interesting one. But we see if it... The club will put on another bit of women's team uh, match at Celtic Park this season. I think there were, I think it was three thousand or so turned up. Natasha yeah. you'd probably correct me um, with that. Um, yeah. Last season, so yeah, interested to see if that happens. I think it, they probably would attract more of a crowd if it was a wee bit more centrally for people to get to. Um, but yeah, long may you know developments there continue. Well, we're we're on the, the subject of developments. I want to just pull us back to the AGM on Friday. Um, and, and this quote from, from Ange Postacoglu when he said, I'll come to you first on this, Natasha, and we will need to be more active in the transfer market. This will be uncomfortable for some. I know fans live to have their heroes, but to achieve this, we will need to be much more active. What, what, what do you take from that? Uh, I think I think we know that Ange is a bit, a bit ruthless. Um, one of the stories that I always remember him telling was his first managerial job. Um, one of the first things he did was call the person who was one of his best friends into his office and tell him that he was letting him go. Um, and he said it took him a few years to speak to him again after that. So I think we know that there's no sentimentality when it comes to Ange. Um, he will let players go if he feels that they need to be let go. I think from that, what we can expect to see is a, you know, a bit a bit of turnover. But that's no bad thing. It keeps it, it keeps it fresh. As long as, you know, there isn't too much turnover. Like he says, we want to have this squad competing in the Champions League every year. Like we touched on earlier in the show, that necessitates it being largely the same squad. If you want to draw on their experience from the year before, you need to keep them here, not playing for someone else in the Champions League. So 
as long as we are keeping the sort of key players in our team, if we're keeping the core of the team, then that's what we want to see. But we do have a big squad. You know, there is there are a lot of players in there. Um, so we can afford some level of outgoing um, if that's then facilitates the incomings that he wants to see. Um, and you can always improve, you know, you can always improve in every single position across the park. Um, and I think one thing we'll see with Ange is that he won't sit still. Um, he'll be constantly looking for improvement regardless of who that player is. You know, you can look at some of your best performers and he'll be looking at how we could do it better, who could do that job better. So I think that's credit to him and We'll, we'll see what happens over the course of the next few transfer windows. Lawrence, what's your take on it? Because I think for too long now, you know, as Celtic fans, we've seen great talent, you know, go out the door. If we go back just 10 years to the amount of players that, that have departed, and it's absolutely fine to, you know, sell a player for big money. I think anybody at Celtic has their price, and if they go, that that's absolutely fine. But it's all about bringing in an adequate replacement so far. Um, I think that Ange Postecoglou has always kind of been one step ahead of the game with that. But when players have went out the door, that we've made sure that you know, like a player like Tom Rogic leaving the club, for instance, in the summer, um, but we already had O'Reilly in the building, um, and that going forward, I think it's important for Celtic. You know, Mark Lawwell's there too, working behind the scenes. I think that brings a bit of stability to us. But you know, as Natasha said, there, if as long as you keep the core of the team, I'm quite happy with that. If it's the odd one or two that go out the door, and that means that that money's going to be invested and two players at five or six million a whip, I think I'll be quite happy with that. I just don't think you want to see a, a wholesale clear out of anybody um, because, you know, Ange Postecoglou keeps talking about, you know, building this house, you know, that the house might take a few battering and bruises through the storms, certainly maybe two at that in the Champions League. Um, it might be time to maybe, you know, build the garage next door to the house. We've, we've got a player model, but we're pretty clear about that, you know, we need to sell players and... Sometimes you give players a chance who maybe aren't quite cutting at Celtic. You'd want to move them on, free up some space in the squad to bring other players on. You know, is Tumble one of those maybe? Sometimes you've got players that want to move. There's no point holding them. Or players, it might be your last chance to sell them, like Juranovic. You know, he's 28, 29. If he's a good World Cup, he's probably going to hit peak value. And then it's up to Tosh and team to have identified a right back to replace him if we're going to sell him. You won't let it sell your first 11. You need to do it in moderation, don't you? You need to be able to kind of keep the style and belief in that team. So, yeah, it wouldn't be any shock to me to find out that Andrew knows how to manage a squad to move players on when they can get peak value for them, to maybe move players that aren't quite going to make it at Celtic. You know, they've had a chance and going, you know what, you're okay, but it's maybe time to give somebody else here a chance. We can get some decent money for you time to move you on and reinvest it. Yeah, you know, players like Van Dyke, maybe, you know, great money for him, but would he have stayed any longer? You know, we had that a couple of seasons ago. Keep up look, look, yeah. look at what he did at Southampton, spat the dummy yeah. out and ended up in the youth team, so, yeah. No. Yeah, so, and we've, we've seen it, but players don't want to be here, and I think uh, Ange has been clear on that, you know, they either want to be here and, you know, call them Strack and was clear on it as well, you know, there's 60,000 people here. You know, you get to play at Champions League, you get to win trophies, what you want to do. And you get players like Samaras who said, you know, you could have went elsewhere for more money, but you want to stay and win trophies. So you, you, I think it's genuinely want to be here. It, it's what you want. And then it players that want to be here, you need to manage a squad. If someone's there, you can maybe get five or six million for them. They want to go. It, it's, it's all parties, doesn't it? If you reinvest that, then you can trust your scouting network. Toshin team in it, the scouting department seem to be doing pretty well the last year or two, so you'd think they'd find people over the required level to come in. I'm I'm sure there is plans already in place. You know, the manager's been cleared about January and and whatever else. But yeah, you know, I think there's a probably a bigger debate around this Natasha with what we've seen in years gone by, but I just don't think that's the that's the way at the club anymore that we, we do we are prepared and you know this one coming in here, um from Brown Warrior saying that, you know, if, if Haxabanovic, sorry, Haxabanovic would be instant cover if, you know, a, a big bid came in for O'Reilly. And there's a good point, Lawrence makes here, I think maybe Jura, that, you know, if a player is going to be peak, you know, kind of transfer value, that needs to be the time. Because I think back to a player like Dedrick Bayata, who's now at Bruges, you know, we had a great chance to probably sell him when he spat the dummy out under Brendan, he brought him back into the fold. And he goes for a free the next year. Um, if you look at a guy like Olivier and Cham too, and it was interesting if it about him, you know, 
probably I think it was Porto, wasn't it? For around £10 million. Yeah. Those are times that when maybe the big bid does come in for a player and if there maybe is that doubt there, it's time to move them on and then reinvest it properly. And that reinvesting properly is maybe just something that's not been done at the football club for, for too long. Yeah, and I think that's starting to change slightly. Um, I think our recruitment has changed massively over the last year or so. Um, where I think we've gone from the balance being the majority of players we bring in don't really work out to almost every player we've brought in has worked out. And I think that swing's been really important because, you know, where you're investing your money at a club like Celtic is so important. And you just have to look at some of the the bargains that we've managed to get along the way. You know, you just have to look at players like Kyogo and Hitati, Maeda, O'Reilly, Haksibanovic. You know, the value that you're playing for these players and the quality you're getting for it is really, really good value for money. So I, I do trust the, the current setup to reinvest properly because they're showing that they are clearly able to identify a good player and a good player without breaking the bank. And that's got to be our model. You know, we have to expect outgoings of these talented players because that's the model. You know, you buy them at X price or you bring them up through the academy, which is happening a lot more rarely. Um, so you buy them for, you know, a lower price, you develop them, you put them on the, some of the biggest stages and then you sell them at a higher price. That is yeah. the way that a lot of our model is going to have to work and we're going to expect to see that. But what we are seeing because of our good recruitment is we're going to be able to do that a lot better and a lot, with a lot more players. You know, when you look at years gone by, you can pinpoint two, three players who are going to be the ones who you can sell on and make the money. Look at our squad now, you know, look at the resale value across that team because they're young. Um, we've got them all signed up mostly, um, you know, on good deals. So there is a lot of resale value in that squad. So there is potential to bring in good sums of money. And yeah, like like we've touched on, you trust the the setup that we've got in place at the moment to reinvest it well. So it's, it's a good position to be in. Yeah, loan me secession plan and Celtic uh, continue. Lord, it's tomorrow night. It will be tough. I think always going to Fur Park is a, a, a tough game. Hopefully we, we come out unscathed. We might even extend the lead at the top of the table. You never know. Um, how many changes do you think that the manager will make just to kind of wrap up? Natasha, was it, you said it was seven at the weekend. Yeah. I'm going to go with four or five. I'm going to say four or five going into tomorrow night. Yeah, I'd say four or five. For a minute there, I thought you said uh, secession plan ran succession. I thought Celtic were no, no. In, no, no. insurrection there. Yeah. But uh, we can but hope. Uh, no, I think kind of four or five again. Yeah. Although, I'm not going to best record just now. You'd expect another three points uh, and some more tangible. Hopefully not last one. It's one else, although it is really elating when you get a last minute winner uh, you would like to see maybe two or three up at half time and then you know some, some changes there and players getting minutes but it's all about getting the three points we've had a crack and buck the weekend as a step into another on a uninterrupted year of I thought six. you were going to start singing Elton John now when you said step <laughs> into no yeah. another uninterrupted year of Celtic's life you know so you know we marched on we never stopped yeah, that's it, absolutely. Natasha, I'm saying four or five changes tomorrow night. What, what do you think? I think possibly the two fullbacks might change again. He might bring in Taylor yeah. and Jura in there. Um, you might see another wee change in midfield, and I think Kyogo might probably start the game because he played fairly decently in one around the last out. And, um, and you might even see Dyza Maida. He likes a goal at Fur Park. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see Maida come in. I think the one that I don't really expect to change, I think you might keep Ralston in. Um, I think it might be a game that Ralston City to, so maybe we'll see Ralston retain his position. Um, but yeah, I'm probably with you guys. I was going to go for about five changes. Yeah, a bad is another one um, who could come yeah. in. Um, That's a good problem to have, isn't it? Look at the absolutely. About. <laughs> absolutely, and it keeps your opposition in your toes because you know those motherboard players won't have a clue what uh -huh. front three and midfield are coming up against. So. That's not a bad thing um, from our perspective. So we'll wrap up on that. The link to a Celtic State of Mind Live is down below the, the video while you're there. Like the video, subscribe to the channel. We're nearing 20k, so if you haven't already done so, please do subscribe to the channel so we continue to bring content free. And um, That's really, really important. Lawrence, Natasha, thanks for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind. This will be our last one before football is uh, paused, um, domestic football anyway. So... First part of the season over. We'll see how we get on in the second part of the season. But thanks to all our, our regular viewers, listeners, for joining.